angels prostrate fall. Let the angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal joy, order and crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, and crown him, Lord of all. He chosen seed. From the fall, he runs on from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, and crown him. said. Amen. Amen. So good to see you all tonight and to hear the singing. You know, it's uh, interesting to me. Many years ago, I visited in a very large church. Auditorium seated about 2,000 people, and there were 2,000 people present. And when it came time for singing the hymns, the folks stood up, and then they began to sing in little tiny voices like this. And um, <laughs> I was with some of my friends, and I don't sing that way, as you've gathered. <laughs> and I was sort of like three-quarters of the way back. And I thought, we're going to sing praise to Christ today, and so I'm going to sing. <laughs> and uh, my friends were rather embarrassed. <laughs> All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 8. And we are looking at the magnificent passage before us that shows how God uses people to change our lives. We're in Acts chapter 8, and we will read through the passage in just a moment. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege of having a God who loves us and cares for us enough to reach down when we are walking in ways that we should not and send people into our lives that change our lives. Father, we thank you that you are a God who uses people because that means you can use people even such as we are. We pray, Father, for your blessings upon your word tonight and we pray that you will use it to reach our hearts and to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. You've called us to reflect him. We have no glory in ourselves. We have no power in ourselves. We have nothing to commend us in ourselves but we have Christ. By your grace, we have Christ. By your mercy, you have made him to be our Savior. And Father, we pray that it will fill our hearts with joy and rejoicing as we go on our way. 
with our lives transformed by the gospel of Christ and those whom you have brought into our lives to help in that transforming process. So we thank you, Father, for this time together, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall the passage that we looked at last week were the immediate preceding verses in verses 36 through 38. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down, both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. We noted last week, this is a very important passage because it deals with believers' baptism. And we find multiple instances in the book of Acts of individuals who are believed, who are saved, and who follow through with a visible act demonstrating that they have trusted Christ. We noted last week as we looked at all these different instances in the book of Acts of baptisms that took place that faith in Christ preceded the baptism of these believers. We saw that there are four kinds of adult baptisms that are listed for us in the book of Acts. Those who have been saved directly out of Judaism, those who are saved out of proselytism, which is what we find here in Acts 8, those who are saved directly out of paganism, and those who are saved out of demonism. We also notice that there was one instance of rebaptism in the New Testament, and that is when the Apostle Paul ran across the disciples of John. They had already been baptized with the baptism of John, but they had to be rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus when they trusted in Christ. Very important to understand that Christian baptism is not the baptism that John performed because there are those today who think that the baptism of John is what is going on in the New Testament. But here are people who had trusted in Christ. They are found late in the book of Acts. The Lord Jesus Christ they were looking forward to but didn't know he had come and gone. And so when they are baptized, they had only received the baptism of John and Paul says you need to be baptized over again. There are those who oppose rebaptism, but these are clearly illustrations where if a person was baptized into some other religion, some other cult, or even a believer who was baptized with the baptism of John, they should be baptized again. We saw that there were basically six different types of baptism in the New Testament. We talked about baptism in general and the meaning of the term, which is to identify or to identify with. The mode is not being stressed by that term, for there were those who were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Same terms are used, and none of them got wet. It was the Egyptians who got wet. We saw the baptism of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus by John, believer's baptism, which is what we spent our time on last week, Infant baptism, which is the issue of household baptisms, which as we get farther into the book of Acts, we will discuss in more detail. And then the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We saw that when an adult head of a house is saved and he has family still under his authority, which would obviously imply children anyway, we'll talk about that more when we get to it, the entire family is baptized. We saw the issues of heresy that have come in with baptism primarily around baptismal regeneration. And there are those who teach that water baptism is necessary for salvation or necessary for sanctification. We saw this on both ends of the extremes, all the way from the Church of Christ, all the way over to the fire movement, which is a reformed movement that has come out of uh, reformed theology and teaches that both water baptism and the Lord's table are necessary to save an infant. So that's why they baptize the infant. It's very much like Catholic theology. 
but they also believe in pedo communion, whereby they will force this newborn infant to take the Lord's table because they feel that it is necessary for the salvation of that infant. But in the New Testament, we saw that both Jews and Gentiles were saved on the same basis, faith in Christ, and it had nothing to do with their water baptism, either as a point of salvation or as a means toward the end of salvation. There are many things that we covered. I'm not going to go over them all again. We talked about the symbolism of baptism. We talked about why there is no baptismal formula in the book of Acts, like there was given at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That baptismal formula never shows up in the book of Acts. Part of the time when you see baptisms taking place, the formula that is given in the name of the Lord Jesus or in the name of Jesus, but never in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. We talk about how baptism applies both to men and women and the implications that has for refuting the concept that baptism replaces circumcision. This is one of the points whereby we see there is a difference between Israel and the church because in the Old Testament only males were circumcised. In the New Testament it makes a point of saying that both men and women were baptized, as we see in Acts chapter 8. Baptism also applied to those who were neither male nor female, to eunuchs. And in the Old Testament, a man who had been emasculated obviously could not have been circumcised. But here we find baptism applied. In fact, those individuals were not allowed to serve in certain positions uh, in the priesthood as they would serve either in the tabernacle or the temple. We saw that baptism applied to persecutors of the church who got saved, Saul who became Paul. We found that baptism applied to Gentiles who got saved. We see Cornelius and his household in Acts 10. We found baptism applies to a household when the head of the house is a female who gets saved, Lydia in Acts chapter 16. We saw baptism of a household applied when the head of the house is a male who got saved, the Philippian jailer at the end of Acts 16. And then we saw baptism applied to Jews who got saved directly out of Judaism and Gentiles in the same place. It wasn't they had to separate them apart and baptize one group here and one group there because we saw Crispus and others, including many of the Corinthians who believed, being baptized at the same time. There is a very clear teaching in the book of Acts that in the body of Christ, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, which eliminates some of these modern heresies whereby, and I know some good brothers in Christ who are Jewish by birth and who still cling to many of the old Jewish traditions and have a four-level tier in terms of people who are valuable in the sight of God. Save Jews first, save Gentiles second, unsave Jews third, unsaved Gentiles fourth. But in the body of Christ, Jews and Gentiles become one in Christ. They become part of the body of Christ, part of the church, not distinct one from another. We saw the rebaptism applied to the followers of John, and then we saw Paul speaking of his conversion back in Acts chapter 9. And now why tarriest thou arise, or literally standing, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So, Jerusalem, there were Jewish males in the temple, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Samaria, Samaritan male and female, and Simon the sorcerer, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ethiopian eunuch, <clears throat> no baptismal formula, formula mentioned here in Acts 8. Paul, three days after his conversion, no baptismal formula was mentioned there. Cornelius and his household, that's Gentile, male, female, and the whole household received the Holy Spirit before water baptism and were baptized in the name of the Lord. And um, rather interesting here when we see the Jewish males first, then mixed breed Samaritans of both genders, then Gentile families, all have a baptismal formula using only the name of Jesus. And if you've been with us on Sunday mornings, you know the in-depth study we have been doing on the name of God 
and how this relates to the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Then the Philippian jailer, a male head of the home, Lydia, the female head of the home, Crispus, household, his, the other Corinthians, and finally the Old Testament baptism, um, or the Old Testament believers uh, who are followers of John the Baptist. Now tonight, we want to move on to verses 39 and 40. When they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Very exciting when we get to verse 40 and see what God does with Philip after he has obeyed what appeared to be an irrational command of God. But we'll save that, the Lord willing, for next week. One of the clear teachings that we see here, and also in many other places of Scripture, is that God uses people to accomplish his will. Now, he can save people just by reading the scripture, and on occasion he does that, but he usually has one of his people who will be there to help the new birth, sort of like a midwife uh, who helps bring this child into the world. And that's what we see here in this passage. I've shared with you in the past, and I will share it just once again very briefly, because I think it will help you understand the principle the principle that we're going to look at tonight in terms of the specific ways in which God uses people in the lives of others at crossroads in our own lives. Back when I was at Stony Brook School for Boys out on Long Island, that was a very long time ago. I started there in 1961 and uh, went through five years. And no, I did not condense four years into five. That was eighth grade through twelfth grade. And uh, while I was there, we had a Bible class. It was my sophomore year, so it would be 1963, um, at Stony Brook. And in the Bible class, the professor wanted to get us thinking to challenge us to know how we could defend our faith if someone put us on the spot and said, you've got to prove to me the existence of God. So he divided the class in half. And half the boys were supposed to argue that there was no God, and half the boys were supposed to argue that there is a God. And it went on for a little bit. And finally, a young, very muscular, tall, <clears throat> and very important part of our basketball team got up and stood in the front of the class and put an X on the blackboard. And then he began to rant and rave and challenge and say, God, if you're really there, prove to us that you exist by erasing this X. And he says, I'll give you three minutes to do it, which was how long he had to talk. Um, so, uh, you know, prove that you exist to us by erasing the X. Now, it was a, a fairly um, mindless kind of argument, but it meant that he didn't have to come up with any other ideas. So he, would, he stood there for three minutes and uh, challenging God. I might mention the fact that that boy later completely rejected the living God and uh, went into some cultic activities. But to make a long story short, right near the end of the three minutes, another classmate, friend of mine, uh, whom I had the privilege of seeing at our 45th class reunion, um, got up silently, walked to the front, took an eraser and erased the X, turned to the challenger and said, God uses people, and sat down. And I thought, boy, that summarizes well what we see all the way through the book of Acts, what we see all the way through the scriptures <coughs> as we see God using the prophets to write the Old Testament for us, as we see God using the apostles to write the New Testament for us. God uses people. And he uses people to transform lives when those individuals under his control are being obedient to the direction that he has given to them. 
If we pause and think about our own past, every one of us can identify key people that God brought across our paths that helped mold us into the men and women that we are today. I know several who seriously affected the course of my life. And I am grateful to God for bringing them in at precise points in my life to bring me to the point that I am here today. Some of that, from the human perspective, would be for good. Some of that, from the human perspective, would be for evil. But the Word of God declares, and we know, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purposes. We have a sovereign God who never allows anything to take place in our life without a specific divine purpose. Even those bad things that happen in our lives have a specific divine purpose for which we can give thanks when we are in fellowship with God himself. Those things that were, from the human perspective, evil, men will give account for those things. But God uses those in ways that are mysteriously strange and unknown to us and which we probably will not know until we get to glory as God is working in our lives to draw us to Christ and then transform us into his image. Let me share with you, and you can be thinking about those who transformed your life, the people that God brought in to make you the person that you are today. The first ones that I thought about were my dad and my mom. They transformed my life because... They gave me an intense love for scripture and an intense love for good music that glorifies God. You have no idea how thankful I am for that. I was their child. Obviously, they're going to influence me. But how I thank God that he gave me parents that brought me up in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and gave me a love for scripture. Didn't just lead me to Christ, though my dad's preaching, which brought me under conviction of sin, and my mother's gentle graciousness in testing my spirit and being there when I trusted Christ, were key elements in that. But they built into my life a love for the scriptures. They built into my life a desire for music that glorifies God. The preaching of my father, the care of my mother to lead me as a child to Christ. And by the way, never take for granted what will happen with your children. It's never too early to make sure that your children and grandchildren know and understand the gospel of Christ. I also had many opportunities through my growing up years to see how to stand alone for what was right. This intersection over a period of years with my parents taught me how to stand alone for that which is right, standing up in the face of ungodly opposition. How many hundreds of times I saw people opposing my father with ungodliness in the mild, gentle, and yet firm way in which he answered them from the word of God. How thankful I am that I saw in my parents a consistency and faithfulness in marriage. Oh, how much I learned just by watching them growing up. They were both strong-willed individuals, powerful individuals, and they had plenty of fights. And I expect those of you who are married have been through that. But I saw their consistency and their determination regardless what came. One man for one woman 
for life. They built it in. And I saw it displayed and exemplified in the faithfulness and consistency of their love in spite of their difficulties. The intersection of lives, how God uses people. I saw something else from them and learned it well, I hope. The importance of swift and painful discipline for violation of their authority and their standards. How important that is in the lives of parents with their children. I saw their willingness to sacrifice and to suffer so that they could serve Christ and not simply take the easy road. Dear people, you are intersecting sometimes for a brief period, like we see with Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch, sometimes for an extended period in the lives of others. What are they learning from you by having the intersection of your life with their lives. I'll tell you about someone else who intersected with my life for those five years at Stony Brook. He's now with the Lord, Mr. Marvin Goldberg. He was my cross country and track coach. From him I learned diligence. From him I learned never to complain, no matter how hard it got. I learned from him that he always expected the best out of those under his authority and care. He would never, never tolerate taking second best effort from any member on the team. But he had a very careful concern for every young man on those teams not just for the star athletes, but for the last guy to come across the finish line. He studied every one of those boys. He every day wrote out an individualized workout for every member of the team. When you went down, there was a bulletin board right next to the track, and on it, in that old duplicator purple, some of you remember the old spirit duplicators, in his own handwriting, you would find every boy's name and next to it precisely what he had to do for his workout that day. We all looked forward with dread to reading MWG's workouts, Marvin W. Goldberg. But he knew what each boy could take he knew how to push each boy to his maximum potential. And he expected each boy to fulfill what he had been assigned to do. Not to be lazy and let the burden of winning the race rest on other team members. I learned from him willingness to overcome physical difficulties and physical pain for greater goals. Both his personal example, he was a man who had elephantiasis of one of his legs and incontinence of the bladder, and he had to wear a bag. But while all of us were wrestling during the winter or playing basketball, you had to be on some athletic team every season, he would go out to the track in the snow and shovel a single path around the quarter mile track so that when we finished our workouts in the other sports that we were required to be in, those who would be in spring track had to come out and run around the track in the snow. I know that man was in pain. That man was in his 60s with great physical disability. But he was determined to have winning teams. And he led by a Christ-like example he wouldn't tolerate swearing. He wouldn't tolerate off-color jokes. He modeled and taught Christ. Another man who had great impact on my life was Dr. Philip Johnson. He was a Bible professor at Gordon College. 
And I learned from him the serious importance of really studying the scripture in the face of opposing viewpoints. It was in college when I first got challenged on the issue of creation versus evolution. And he was a great encouragement to me on the issue of biblical creationism. You know, folks, you know that is something that changed my life and it still impacts my life today because I had to face some very brilliant and very scientifically well-trained professors in a day and age when there were no creationist writings out there. And that also brings up the fact that affecting your life direction can also take place by those who oppose or who challenge your faith. One of those in college was Dr. Richard Wright, who slapped me down in a public uh, setting, in the college setting, concerning that creation-evolution debate. He taught theistic evolution at a so-called Christian college. And he set me on a lifelong quest to demonstrate from scripture and science that his teaching was heresy. I got challenged that way by an unknown Methodist preacher. I don't know what his name was. I only know that I, w I was at a youth camp one summer up in the hill country around San Antonio, north of San Antonio. It's called the Hill Country Brush Arbor Revivals up there. And I got called on publicly after he had been teaching on some other subject. Somebody else said, this man is teaching theistic evolution. Christian Spencer, you answer him. I was a college student. And I had to stand up and say why I believed from the word of God that creation took place in six literal days and the reasons why I believed that. And here's this man who has had far more training than I had ever had and I had to challenge and debate him in public on the spur of the moment. I had to be able to give a reason for the faith that was in me with meekness and fear. I spoke with somebody who was at that camp meeting about a month and a half ago. They still remembered that meeting. Someone I hadn't spoken to in perhaps 45 years. They remembered that meeting. There was an intersection of lives there. And it transformed somebody else's life. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That's a command, not a suggestion. People who have changed your life. Dr. Johnson also taught me the importance of knowing New Testament Greek, a study which my father had begun for me in seventh grade. He taught me calmness of spirit, not anger, in facing down heresy. We had a special speaker at a funded lecture. It was an endowed lecture that took place. The entire school had to gather for it and a man by the name of Dr. Philip Edgecombe Hughes stood up and taught heresy concerning the blood of Christ. And when the lecture was over during the question and answer period, Dr. Johnson hadn't stood up and confronted him during the lecture, but in the question and answer period, Dr. Johnson stood up. And he said, well, I want our students to understand here that what Dr. Hughes has just taught is heresy. He said it calmly and quietly. And he said, because the blood of Christ is the basis upon which our salvation rests. And he went through various scriptures calmly and quietly and sat down. And the student body, it was like you could hear a pin drop. Nobody ever challenged a special funded speaker who came in and spoke to the whole college like that. I learned from him that the anger was not necessary, though it was something that made my blood boil, but an articulation of the truth of the word of God. Folks, that affected every student and every faculty member and every member of the administration who attended that lecture. The intersection of one life with many lives and what a transformation that caused. Another man who affected my life was Anton Marco. 
If you're in the music world, you would have heard of Anton Marco, a student of Tito Ruffo, one of the greatest baritones of all time. And Anton Marco, it's a very interesting story how this came about, but I'll summarize it quickly. Anton Marco had sung for many years with the San Carlo Opera Company, and he was the voice trainer for George Beverly Shea. He's the one who taught George Beverly Shea, who used to sing for the Billy Graham Crusades, and I know the position of this church on Billy Graham, but he taught George Beverly Shea to sing, who was known all over the world for a quarter of a century for his magnificent voice. And through a series of very interesting events, he took me as a student while I was a pastor up in North Jersey at Mountain View Gospel Church. And every week I would go and my mother was paying for these lessons down in Texas. She was already a widow at that time on a limited income. But she wanted me to study with this man. He was a godly man. Interestingly, he had a son named after him who was deeply involved with a legal organization with which I later became a part. And you know, he only charged me $3 for a half hour lesson. A man who could command $100 for a half hour lesson. And he almost always extended it to an hour or longer. My father had given me the basics of voice, but the reason I can sing today is because of Anton Marco, a man who changed my life. And then when God called me to go to law school, he gave me back as his gift to go to law school every cent that had been paid to him in tuition plus some. A man who loved Christ, who had a vision for what he could do in the lives of others who would use their voices to serve Christ. Anton Marco. I look at two friends of mine who are brothers. I'll not mention their names. They're still alive and still with us. But two men about my age who made a tremendous impact in my life by their friendship and by the encouragement that they gave to me in their earnest desire to study Scripture their earnest desire to know Christ and to serve him with everything that they have. It doesn't just have to be someone who has taught you, who builds into your life, but someone that God gives you to minister to, who will give you encouragement by their love and responsiveness to the word of God. Another man who deeply affected my life was Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost. He was one of my professors at Dallas Seminary. He had a pastor's heart while being a serious student of theology. I had many professors who were very bright in seminary, and they would love to debate you about how many angels can stand on the head of a pin. But I discovered that the ones from whom I learned the most were those who were involved in pastoral ministry as well as being teachers at the seminary. Dr. Pentecost was one of those men. Of course, the person who has perhaps most affected my life in innumerable ways is my dear wife. She has kept in check my impetuous spirit. Being married to Judy has changed me in thousands of ways, and I believe for the better. Just as the intersection of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch here in Acts chapter 8, it was clearly the hand of God that caused our paths to cross on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, Israel. And I might add, in the 
smiling humor of God that was in the context of a school founded by a former Bible Presbyterian professor of Old Testament who is now with the Lord. Oh, I could tell you how many ways in which God has changed me through Judy, but you have seen that while we've been here. Others whose lives have intersected with mine and who have affected me, my children. That's a real challenge where the life is intersected, <laughs> where we learn to deal with multiple challenges of character and with the old sin nature in very close proximity. And seeing my own sinful self reflected and enlarged in the next generation. It's a point that God uses to teach us humility, that we're really not so great. It's a point that God uses to bring back our memories, the things we see our children doing, and then bringing us back to a point where we did that, and thus bringing us to confession of sin. It's the kind of intersection that God uses to make us more earnest in our striving for diligence and fidelity to Christ. And then, of course, within the last few years, the intersection of life with my grandchildren. God has used that to help me understand that I'm growing older, that I have fewer years in which to serve Christ. God has used that to make me aware of the importance of not wasting even one usable minute in the most intense and best possible way for Christ. I've just given you a few people that God in his sovereignty, Romans chapter 8, has brought people into my life to intersect at precise points in my life like God did with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, folks, if we don't apply the scripture that we're studying to our own lives, it does us no good to fill our heads with theology. What you really believe will transform your life. And you are intersecting every day with the lives of other people. The question is, what is coming out of that intersection? If you belong to Christ, what impact are you making in the lives of others for eternity? God sent Philip on what looked like a wild goose chase. But God had a purpose in the middle of a desert for one man who was on his way out of the country. It was a brief encounter. Pause for just a moment and reflect on those who have crossed your path. Some have been for good, some for evil. But every one of them was divinely superintended, directed, or permitted to test, refine, improve, or challenge your character. Every one of those people was designed to help form you into the image of Christ. Who crossed your mind while we were speaking? Some who changed your life did so in a good way, some in a bad way. But every one who made a change in your life opened new doors for you and at the same time closed other doors forever. It's quite obvious as you think about the idea of marriage. When you married, you opened certain doors. But you also closed certain doors. You eliminated certain possibilities, but you gained other possibilities. When you trusted Christ, you opened innumerable possibilities. And you eternally eliminated other possibilities that you will never have to face. 
Our text tonight shows us how one obedient Christian can be used to change the life of someone else forever. For good, for joy, for blessing. When they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. That was instantaneous. That the eunuch saw him no more. Did the eunuch look confused? Look around and say, man, I wonder where that guy went. He said to himself, this must not have really been real. That, that guy isn't here. And I can see all over the desert. There's nobody around here. He's not here anymore. Must have been a figment of my imagination. Maybe I fell asleep while this was going on. No, I'm wet. We don't find him doing any of that. It says, the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. A very brief encounter here. Note what we learned from the text. It was a divine appointment. In the preceding verses, we saw that God specifically directed Philip. It was a divine appointment. There are no accidents in the plan of God. Number two, it was a timed appointment. The Samaritan revival was over. God had finished one area of ministry in the life of Philip. And as we look at the life of Philip, we discover that God uses Philip in multiple ways. He uses him to call, cause a citywide revival and the suppression of demonism. He uses him in an individual witnessing situation to lead one person to Christ. As we'll learn next week, God next uses him in a church planting ministry that takes 19 years. And in that 19 years, he goes 55 miles. But he was obedient in each stage of God's plan for his life. It was a timed appointment and we see no lag time in service between the Samaritan revival and coming in contact with the Ethiopian eunuch. Third, it was a prepared encounter. God had prepared the eunuch's heart in advance. Do you realize that every time you have an encounter with someone where you have opportunity to share the gospel, God has prepared them in a certain way? Think about Pharaoh and Moses. God had prepared Pharaoh's heart too because God was going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that Moses and the children of Israel could leave Egypt. Half the times it talks about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. The other half of the times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There was a man prepared with a hardened heart. There was a man who would come and proclaim the word of God and the heart would get harder. And that prepared man here met this prepared man here and God caused their paths to intersect at a precise time. And God caused his will to be done as the children of Israel were led out of Egypt by a high and mighty hand, the scripture says. The hand of God. Prepared. It was a prepared encounter. Fourth, it was an encounter where the Bible was central. Dear people, when we have these encounters with those who are lost, and whom God has prepared one way or the other, the sword that will divide down the middle, so that they fall either to the left or to the right, is the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It was an encounter where the Bible was central. Fifth, it was a supernatural opening of doors. You will know specifically when God is opening a door, your job is to walk through it. Here we find Philip is invited to come up into the chariot. God supernaturally opened that door and we talked in detail about that in weeks past how impossible this would have been. This man would not have been traveling alone. 
He would have been surrounded by bodyguards. He's the treasurer of an entire nation going through a wilderness filled with bandits. It is a supernatural opening of the doors. It was a crossroads encounter. At this juncture, Philip would be going north and the eunuch would be going south, exact opposite directions. It was an unexpected desert encounter for both men. An unexpected desert encounter for both men. You may be the one who has the word of hope in the middle of a desert that someone else is walking through. It's a desert experience for both, but one has what he knows to be true, the other is questioning, as was the eunuch. It was an encounter where God provided the necessary water for the baptism in a very unlikely place. Deserts are not places where you find lots of water. There are torrential streams that go down what are called wadis. They're seasonal, but they last only perhaps for an hour before they dry up and soak into the soil. We find that the eunuch wanted to express his faith publicly, and God enabled him to do so. Not merely the precise timing of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, but the precise timing of the eunuch's faith, where he declares, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he says, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? They weren't a mile from that or a mile past that. They were precisely at that point when he requested the expression of his faith publicly. Rather interesting here, too, because we know that there was at least the chariot driver, because he commanded him to pull the chariot to a stop. The chariot driver heard what was going on, but we see no response of the driver saying, I believe also. We see no response of what we are certain would have been an armed guard surrounding this chariot, though they heard Philip also explaining this to the eunuch. There was one man out of that group who heard, trusted in Christ, and was saved. You may find a situation where you have spoken publicly and others have heard, but only one responds. I have seen situations like that myself. Notice it was a transitional encounter into new ministries for both men. Both people here would then affect the lives of many other as well as affecting the lives of each other. Both went on to have an impact on the lives of many other people. Philip as he went north evangelizing, the Ethiopian eunuch as he went south and an entire nation comes to Christ. Those encounters are not merely one-sided. Those encounters will be two-sided when we're walking by faith and in the center of God's will. When God's goal was accomplished, he took Philip away supernaturally. It was a divinely shortened encounter. That has made me pause to think of the many times that I have avoided the short encounters. I didn't have quite enough time. I thought, don't have time to stop and witness to this person now. I'm in a rush. I have to get somewhere. How many times in our own lives have we, as we look back, avoided the short encounters? Oh, we like to have friendship evangelism. We like to get to know people. Uh, we like to have, you know, friends and uh, talk to them, you know, well, you know, there must be a God kind of conversations. Philip didn't have time for that. This was a divinely shortened encounter. When God's goal was accomplished, he took Philip away supernaturally. That kind of shortening can happen in many ways. Perhaps someone that you've witnessed to moves away or you move away. Or perhaps 
you or that person dies, you have only a brief moment of encounter. Perhaps there will be a change of position or status in life, like someone who is at your job or at your school for a very short time so that you can witness to them. And that's why God put them there. Not because they needed a job or not because they were going to go to school anyway. God brought them across your path in one of those two or multiple other circumstances of life so that you could witness to them. The next thing we notice is when a life is changed for Christ, it produces joy and it produces forward movement. Both experience this by believing and obeying the scripture. Both of them had joy and there was forward movement into new ministries. We also discover as we look at this text when key people who are in the center of God's will change your life, it produces a bond of fellowship that will never be broken, even if you are parted one from another. It's a bond that lasts into eternity. Do you think when Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch died, and they both did, 2,000 years ago, do you think that when they entered into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, they just sort of went, oh, hi, I think I've seen you somewhere before. Let me go and do some other stuff. Or do you think that that was a bond of fellowship and joy that continued on and continues on in heaven today? Philip coming over to the Ethiopian eunuch and the Ethiopian eunuch beaming with joy and embracing one another and talking about that exciting intersection of lives in the middle of a desert and the grace and sovereignty of God to arrange that meeting and the illumination of the scriptures that Philip gave to the eunuch and Philip rejoicing in this brother and this brother rejoicing that Philip gave him a message to carry back to his home country oh people what we miss by not using the intersections in our lives that God gives to us and what eternal consequences that has. We learn something else here is you can experience this also when you become one of the key people that God uses to change the lives of others. You can experience this when you become, not waiting for someone else to transform you, but when you become one of those key people that God uses to transform the lives of others. And then you will never have an intersection in life that is not ordained by God. That's very clear in this text. You will never have an intersection in life that is not ordained by God. The question is, how will you use that intersection? How will you manifest Christ at that intersection? How will you obey the command of God either to witness to one who is lost, or how will you obey the command of God to comfort, warn, exhort, teach, encourage, or bring blessing and joy to one who is saved? You have intersections, dozens of them, in life every day. How are you obeying the command of God in relation to that one with whom your life intersects at that moment? You know, God controls these intersections in our lives with the lives of others to accomplish certain things. Sometimes it's to burn off the waste products in our lives the carnal motives, the carnal actions, the delusional pursuits that plague us and waste our time. God also controls the intersections in our lives and the lives of others to build up our faith, to strengthen our resolve to follow Christ, to encourage us, to comfort us in our times of distress. But back to our personal responsibility. 
Don't just look for others who will change and bless your life. Many people in the Christian world are like that. They just go to church to be blessed. They just have fellowship with others to be blessed. What they want to have when they turn on their Christian radio or Christian TV is to be blessed. Dear friends, don't look for others who will change and bless your life. Tomorrow, or perhaps even tonight, God will enable you to be a key man or woman who changes and blesses the life of someone else. When that opportunity comes, what will you do with it? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this beautiful text, which shows us that this intersection of life between Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch not only brought a new ministry to the life of each one of those men, but filled them with joy. And as they walked in obedience to your word, you used them in powerful ways in the days and years that lay ahead. Help us, Father, even when your direction sometimes seems irrational to us, to be willing to obey your word, to be willing to intersect in the lives of others where we see a need to be willing to boldly and without shame share the scripture. Sometimes there will be rejection, but as there was rejection by Pharaoh when Moses brought your word, even so you are working in a way that will sovereignly accomplish your purposes to the glory of Jesus Christ, your son. And when there is a positive response, what joy that brings, what fellowship, what communion, and what increased ministry. Help us each to realize that we will give an account for all the intersections in our lives. We cannot change those intersections of the past. But Father, enable us and empower us by your Spirit as you have promised to do, so that all the intersections in our lives in the future will result in glory of Jesus Christ and the joy and rejoicing of believers and the contentment and satisfaction of heart that we have known your will and we have obeyed it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.